So we'll uh, call the Sunderland Elementary School Committee meeting to order uh, February 2nd, uh, 2020, or yeah, 2021, uh, at 6 p.m. All right. Uh, can I get a motion to uh, approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Also outstanding. Uh, any discussion? All right. Uh, Keith? Yes. Uh, Maisie? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. Unanimously approved. Thank you, Peter. All right. Uh, financial statements. Hi. Um, I did not send you a formal report this month because there really wasn't a whole lot new to discuss for FY21, um, but I'm happy to take questions. I shared the expense reports with you as they are to date. Um, just a reminder, the budget is frozen. You all agreed to that last month, um, so there's limited expenses happening at this point. Um, but you did review and sign 13 warrants since the last meeting, totaling $65,445.90. I'm happy to take questions if you have them. Otherwise, I'll talk to you again when we get to 22 budget. <laughs> Anyone? All right. Thank you, Shelly. All right. And now public comment. Uh, I know we had one email in. Uh, I didn't know, you know, has anyone else? There is no other comment? I believe that's it. All right. So. We have uh, Shelly Chialik has asked us to read this. Uh, she's a, yeah, she explains herself who she is. <clears throat> Dear school committee members, I would first like to start by thanking all of you, Mr. Modesto, Mr. B, and all of our nurses. Uh, this is my first time ever writing a letter to the committee, and I myself have felt pretty safe and confident coming into school every day. And I have not worried uh, feeling unsafe at our school. I work in fourth grade, and I hear the kids reminding uh, each other to wash in before entering the class. And the most impressive is at the end of the day when I hear them say to each other, to wash out before you get on the bus. I feel the uneasiness of my coworkers and I care about and respect their feelings of uneasiness. Even though my tolerance for fear is much different, I respect my peers and I want them to be heard. My biggest scare came when I heard we were going to open our doors and allow student teachers in the building and in our classrooms. While I know the importance of their education, how valuable it is to them, I totally disagree with it this year. We work very hard monitoring our kids and each other to be sure we are all well and strong to be in our building and teaching and learning. I don't think I need to go into the reasons why I feel we should not allow student teachers in our school. It's pretty obvious, parentheses. We don't even allow parents and people we know in the building, and parentheses. Tonight, I ask you please to listen to us as we are very uneasy and scared for our health on this decision to allow student teachers into our school. Also on another topic, I would like us to consider having remote days when the temperature drops very low and our classrooms hit 30 because the windows are open. I had a very hard time teaching the other day as I shivered with a winter coat and hat on all day. I watched students struggle as they did their best to cope with the horrible situation. If we must be in the classroom, Instead of remote on these days, I ask that space heaters be bought for the classrooms. This might get expensive, as each class would need at least four. I'm concerned as I feel we are not making the best decision we can for our school. I hope we can resolve these issues because I really hate writing these letters. Again, thank you for all that you do. Sincerely, Shelley Shalik. All right. Um, I know that we're going to... Uh, Ben, you probably have an update uh, with regard to student teachers when we get there. Um, if we have no other public comment, uh, the issue of uh, of the temperatures in the classroom, you want to take that on for a second? Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so you know, last Friday was pretty chilly out. Um, I, I think the temperatures were going to get negative, between negative 9, negative 10-ish. Um, and, you know, we discussed it as, you know, administrative team, whether or not we do cancel school or remote school on that day. Um, right now, you know, so right now we do have the proper air circulation. We have the proper, you know, um, we put in <clears throat> ultraviolet lighting. 
in Sunderland. We also put in the proper, you know, uh, filters and such. And we also encourage teachers to crack windows to increase airflow. But the increased airflow there is, you know, is is an extra, you know. And so, what you know, and while I hear that, you know, teachers are keeping windows open three, six inches, multiple windows open that much, and their rooms are going to get, you know, we get below thirty-two degrees or you know, any kind of coldness, you, we're gonna, the heat system is going to have trouble keeping up. So I understand the problem. Um, you know, part of this, the solution, you know, there is, you know, one, you don't have to crack your windows as far. You're still going to get plenty of airflow you know, with smaller cracks. To do it in shifts, air out the room a little bit more a couple times, you know, either once an hour, twice an hour, whatever, you know, you feel comfortable um, doing so that the heating system can keep up with that. So, I mean, it's a good question overall. You know, it's a, it's an extra thing. Um, we also um, you know responded to, when we responded to the association um, that you know you can also wear double double face masks. You know, you can do a shield and a mask on that day. Increase your PPEs if you're feeling that the airflow being one protection has has come down. Um, so, you know, I, I hear it. That's it's kind of the trying to balancing the two out. You know, um, you know, going remote days when you know we're we're scheduled. Um, to be in person is uh, um, balancing the safety and, um, you know, getting kids into the building. And so I, I don't think it was a huge safety difference from, you know, my perspective and how we are doing things overall. Um, but I also know anytime, you know, I understand the teacher's perspective as well. It's, it's, your, it's, one, of the, it's one of the things they're using. Um, and if they feel like they can't use it, they feel less, maybe feel less safe. And, and I'm reading into with, I mean, I'm reading that hard into it. Um, so that's kind of where it stands, you know. Um, you know, we could we could have a temperature number. Um, it would be an arbitrary number. Um, right now, the temperature for closing schools is negative 20 to 25 is what the, you reach with windshield factors when we would close for when you have over 15 minutes. I'm sorry, less than 15 minutes of exposure can lead to injury. So that's kind of the 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 window we've used in the past, the last time we closed school, and I, you know, they had written me directly on that. Um, I explained that the last time we closed schools, it was negative 30. So, I mean, just kind of getting the perspective of, of, of temperature. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of one of those things of, um, I don't have a clean answer other than that's how we made our decision, and that's what we gave for a follow-up when the, this, you know, it was brought to us, um, you know, uh, through the association. So, you guys want to give me thoughts on that? You can certainly. Um, any yeah, uh, any comments, questions? Um, I would just like to say that I think that um, I in, in various things over this past almost year now, I've uh, been concerned about making sure that we address the concerns or fears of the teaching staff and so on, and that continues to be the case. But I also think that. Darius, you and your whole crew have done a, a an outstanding job in doing exactly that. And um, so, you know, I still I, I still worry about it, but I think we're we're going down the correct path here. And um, you know, but the, the fact is we're still all, you know, myself included, we're still all scared of this thing. So I don't uh, I understand totally where the teachers are coming from and to the extent that we can nudge a little one way or a little the other way in order to make uh, them feel more comfortable then you know we should be doing that agreed um i mean the, the idea of space heaters i mean we can we can i mean going out and buying them is one thing borrowing them from people might be might be another option you know um i also know we start running into fire code issues as well when we start bringing in space heaters chief yeah. will probably jump in me on that um but um, yeah, it's it's. But it's also you're not going to keep up if you have all your windows open in a classroom. It, it's just your your um, that kind of thing. So it's it's trying to balance the amount of airflow on those days. Reduce you know you're going to be reducing the amount of exchange, and you're probably getting more than enough exchange if the room's that cold. So um, yeah, I mean yeah. So I, I'll, I'll open other suggestions. Like we tried again, we tried to do more PPEs, and we could you know we could set a number for remote. Um, my fear on doing that was, you know, um, it's not, it's not a, a problem in all buildings. Um, it's, it, it really, it's not a problem in all classrooms. It has to do with the amount of window opening that's making the individual teacher feel comfortable. 
Um, and that's kind of hard to, that's hard to balance. And I, that's tricky, I think. Um, and so, I mean, I, you know, we could say like something, you know, negative 10 moving forward, if you want, or do something like that, you allowed to set those kind of policies. Um, I don't know. Keith, you had a, a common question? Yeah, I mean, I, I just weigh in as well. I mean, so I heard the, the two issues that were brought up in the letter. One was about the student teachers. The other was about the, the windows being open. Um, and I think I would agree with Darius and Peter. Um, the window opening is an extra right now. I think we've met the, the safety standards between the with the air ventilation and then the masks and the, the social distancing and the cohorts. Um, we've tried to do as much as we can responsibly. I do the same thing. I open the windows in my classroom. And then last week, I the air pours in. I mean, you just don't have to open it that much for the air to really pour in. You're getting fresh, additional fresh air. So it's, that's, it. that's an extra. And I think that there's a balance that has to happen there. So I'm not um, looking to, to set a policy on a, just picking a random temperature and, and, and doing that going forward. I, I, I hear the concerns. I feel like I'm living it too. But, I, you know, I'm happy with I think we're, we're, we're striking the right balance right now. And then for the, te for the student teachers, um, I mean, I'll let Ben sent an email out earlier, but I would agree, I hear what they're saying. I agree with them and I think I would uh, defer to Ben's letter on our email on that one. Yeah, in the, in the follow up on, on you know, Ben's, uh, basically student teachers are, I leave that to the building based. So um, we do have student teachers in other buildings in the district, um, just again, a different climate of, um, you know, the teachers are being tested by their universities weekly. Um, you know, they, they sign pledges that they will have do appropriate behavior um, as well. Um, you know, you're talking about, you, you know, we have an obligation to um, help prepare the next level, next generation of teachers. And even this year with the retirement benefits that are being put up at the state, you're gonna have a massive amount of increase of openings next year. And so it's kind of, again, it's a balancing act. And um, if the teachers who are the cooperating teacher want to have teachers, Ben's gotta have to balance that out between other teachers in the building feeling comfortable. And I think he's, um, I think he's come up with a solution and putting a delay in where I think at the time I think we'll have the majority of people vaccinated. And so Ben, you want to keep on going a little bit further there? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I've met with the uh, supervising practitioners from the two colleges that would be sending us student teachers over the past couple of days. And we've reviewed expectations, safety protocols, uh, so on and so forth. Um, I, with them, I, I discussed delaying the start of any in-person um, student teaching experiences. And so for the classrooms that would have the um, setup to shift to a virtual student teacher, um, I'm talking with those teachers individual. For some classrooms, it would not work at all, which would probably end up meaning a, a change of placement for that student teacher. And that's actually already happened with, with one other individual. Um, for the, the practicums, they, they range from eight to ten, eight to 12 weeks, weeks long. And, and some of the, some of them need to be a hard 12 weeks. Um, so with one university, I talked about delaying the start until March 15th and having the first few weeks be virtual. Um, and then that experience would extend to the, to the end of the school year, but there's still work to be done with this and, and more discussions to be had. And we're going to discuss it as a staff tomorrow at our staff meeting as well. Outstanding. Yeah. So all good answers. Uh, it, it bummed me out a little bit that, uh, that Shelly indicated that she, uh, hates to write these letters because we absolutely want to hear, uh, from teachers and their concerns and it's better to have it discussed. Uh, you know, I feel like we, at least it's, it's in the open and we have, uh, a remedy for the, the temperature issue. Uh, again, uh, you only need to win, open the windows so often, and if it's too cold, keep them closed more. It, it sounds like the practical remedy, uh, and I can imagine if things got too cold, then we'd obviously have to make a call. Um, it might be a different uh, number than than what we've used in the past, but we can we can take that as it comes. Um, all right. Next item on the agenda, the uh, Anti-Racism and Equity Committee update. Do we have an update there? Yeah, we do. Kelsey's supposed to join us, so um, I don't know um, what her timing is. So we'll, if, we, if we can come back to her, that'd be great um, when she arrives. 
All right. Uh, in that case, on to the COVID-19 update. So my update on this platform is that we are um, on two, two different things I want to talk about is the pool testing and the um, vaccinations. So on pool testing, so right now where it stands is, you know what I meant to mention that in the minutes it said we already started it. We probably want to fix that in that minutes there, Peter, when you get a chance. You know, I should have mentioned when you guys were voting the minutes, it said that I've already started pool testing. We haven't started that yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so the state is trying to roll. So what the state is, I, I think I explained this a lot last last time. So I'll try to I'll move a little quicker through it. And you guys know I can talk fast. Um, so right now where we're at is we've applied and been accepted to be a, a pool uh, a pool testing um, district. However, we're waiting for the state to assign us a vendor, and they we're supposed to start next Monday. And so they're they're rolling it out as fast as they can. Which is sometimes I appreciate, but I'm not sure if they their their timing wise isn't going to give us enough time to really get the, you know the um, mm -hmm. vendor is going to have to provide us with consent forms. It's going to be done electronically, but to you know how that well if you don't know how that works, trying to get things to families and back from families and get you know as much participation as possible. We need more than just a couple of days. Um, you should see us at the beginning of the year is just trying to get regular paperwork back and forth. Um, you know, we need more than that. So it's going to be a tight window to start next week. Right now, we are still going to try to move forward um, and at least use next week as a trial week. You know, maybe do what we can do, get what forms we can in and just kind of see where the difficulties we will have after, you know, the winter break, um, which is the following week, you know, to kind of roll it out for those five weeks after that. They are not changing the six weeks window. So if you don't start it on that week, then you just have less weeks of uh, free free pool testing. So it is a free pool testing. Um, and then afterwards, it's going to it's going to cost. And so what I what I want to do is I, I didn't think it's going to hurt at all to try this, see if it works, and then you know maybe on week four of it um, have a conversation um, about how do we move forward, talking with the association, the union talking with you know um, administration and such, just how do you roll out in the nurses, obviously, um, in our public health nurses and so how to roll out, what did it find, was it beneficial? Um, at the same time, vaccinations should be taking place. So we're heading down that right road of trying to you know, bring greater safety to our schools. So it, it may work out that if we drop teachers from the numbers, that number's gonna drop a, a bit um, right now looking at the cost for the remaining 11 weeks, it would be about $8,500 $8, um, to pool test, which is right now, Sunderland doesn't have um, a lot of reserves for that. Um, and if you remove teachers from that number, you know, um, basically take your 40 times five, you know, and put that in there. So it comes down a little bit, um, but, there are other things that we can do that we'll discuss after we roll this out and see how it works. I mean, we could do, we can do is we contract after we're done with the state, we then contract with the vendor under the state buying guide um, directly. So we can choose what we want to do. We could say, and these are just things to think about as we go through this, you know, we're going to do certain grades every other week, or we're going to do, you know, more high risk groups, um, you know, instead, you know, um, there are some districts, I'm talking with other superintendents, there's a lot of districts not doing it, which is interesting. Um, they're either too disruptive, um, whatever the cost, the um, uh, trying to coordinate that and whatever other reasons they may have. Um, some schools are looking at just doing their secondary with it because their secondary is more mobile than their elementary, meaning the kids are going off and you know they have more freedoms to be interacting and changing their cohorts on a social level than elementary students can. So, you know, some so different districts are doing different things. And I think we're gonna look at that as we go through. So that decision's coming down the pipe with hopefully with um, with more information about how it's going and such. So any any questions on pool testing? I, I could go, I, I know a lot of the details of it. We're trying to work through them, but I know kind of how it all works if people have questions on that. And Darius, if I could add a couple of things, I, I met today with our school nurse, Samantha Fabian, and um, our nurse leader, Meg Birch. Um, one of the things that we talked about was if this is not ready to be up and running next week, like the actual testing, 
we could still do practice and trial runs, um, even if it's just a fake Q-tip Q -tip swab um, so that students get used to the experience because it's, I mean, there's a, it is a absolutely huge lift to turn any school into a, a mass testing site for all, all students and all students and staff. Um, the other thing, which is, um, and each building is a little bit different, but what is one of the things that is unique to Sunderland is that our school nurse is going to need support with this um, in order to test um, 157 students and staff. There will need to be an extra person in the building, whether we look to hire an, an LPN for um, a day or two each of those weeks to, to support this. Um, especially during COVID, because if someone becomes symptomatic, then we need the nurse with that person in the um, in the emergency care room, basically. So yeah, uh, there are a lot of discussions um, being had right now, and we'll be working out more of those logistics um, in, the, in the days to come. One of the things that we also had talked about was testing some groups on uh, Monday and other groups on Tuesday. A as you know, we have um, our A and B cohorts. Some kids are here four days a week. Some kids are here two days a week. So um, if we were to test on Monday and Tuesday, we'd be able to hit all of those students and staff that are in the building. Any other questions? Just wanted to confirm that we would be having second grade and above self-administering the swabs, right? So where that's that's not necessarily um, we're not sure yet. We 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 have to see, right? So the the guidance from the state and Darius, correct me if I'm wrong, is that they say grade second second grade and above can self-administer, but it it might be one of those things where we. Um, we kind of give it a trial run that first week and and see how it goes. Um, uh, some schools have have talked about having the um, the the swabs done all at the same time, led by the classroom teacher, and um, and then putting them in the bag or wherever they go, boxed up. Um, so that's that's something that's going to be worked out at at each building level. So, and in, in just just remember also within this that there are schools that have been doing this for months now, um, and so those are the kind of that's where they're getting their guidance and trial runs from. So that's where they're saying grades two and above. I, I suppose it's a new the new norm. And again, it's not the tickle your brain swabbing; it's just outer nostril. I know early on they were really they were tickling people's brains. People were going, "Whoa, that was a heck of a test!" Now, um, having tested having tested myself, it's, it's the outer it's the outer for those watching the outer quarter inch of the nostril. Um, so, um, the other thing about Ben was talking about, you know, help. We've also reached out to, um, our nursing connections. We do use student nurses. So again, it comes up with student teachers, student nurses that the, um, we'll have to find out if Sunderland's going to be, um, open to doing that, but we're trying to get student nurses who are also tested weekly, um, to come down and help, um, with the administration on certain days. And so Meg has reached out to them. They said they were open to that. So again, getting extra um, help and um, training from those, you know, those people. But when you're, they're going and doing it, they're fully PPD with N95s, masks, um, shields and such, um, because they're, they may have to go in and do the testing themselves. So it's, it's not like a, the average day teacher, they'll have gloves and all the other stuff. So it's a, a kind of a different level there. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, outstanding. I guess uh, then we're on to the uh, fiscal year 22 budget discussion. Peter? Do you want to start the budget discussion and then we might have to stop for the anti-racism or do you want to move on to something else and circle back? So here's my guess. It's my guess is that um, because Kelsey's not on yet, she didn't do the old wait 15 minutes because we got to do that beginning public comment and that kind of thing. My guess is that she believes that this meeting starts at seven because all our other meetings had started at seven and we moved to six o'clock when we went to these singleton nights. So um, maybe we we go ahead and I think we should go ahead and start instead of wait a half hour. Um, and then when she jumps on, maybe we just we can kind of pause and relax our brains for a minute and then and hear about what's going on and then go back to it. That sounds good. It's your call, Greg. Actually, yeah. your... <laughs> uh, that, that works for me. Peter, you have something. I, Darius, didn't you say you were also going to talk something about vaccines under your COVID report? 
Yes, you know, it's in my superintendent report and my COVID report, so I'll do that now if you want to. No, I just, whatever. Which, when, once you start the next subject, I was like, oh, I'll just add that on the end. Okay. But, so if you want me to go on there now? Sure. Um, okay, I'll just keep going. It's, it's not a whole lot to tell right now. So we are working closely with um, the local boards of health and the uh, Franklin County coordination of vaccinations. And, um, you know, right now they're they're gearing up to do vaccinations for 75 plus and 65 plus, as you may, may have heard, there's some politics and whatnot about where the vaccinations are flowing in Massachusetts and, you know, how it seems like Eastern Mass is getting more of them. I don't know. I don't know the details of that in the sense of, are they getting more because they have more population or are they getting more per population percentage wise? I don't know where the, where the angle starts, but um, it seems to be frustrating that these, some schools out there have already got their teachers, um, vaccinated where we haven't got them and we haven't got to our 75 year olds done yet. Um, but right now they're looking at the week of the 15th, they're going to be opening up. Um, they're, they're expecting, I think a 3000 vial shipment to start doing the, um, older population 75 plus and 65 plus. Um, and then they're going to start working on teachers. They have secured, I believe it's finalized. They've secured, um, the, um, uh, Treehouse Brewing, who purchased the old Channing Beat building, um, is, you know, they're in between their construction phase. That's a great building. We had reached out to the, them to have make Frontier at a uh, vaccination site um, um, just because of the size and the ability that we can do here. Um, however, that's even better since so it's not going to interrupt our, interrupt any education going on. And it's close enough that it's a quick ride for our teachers to just get over um, and such. And so we'll try to coordinate. Um, it's going to come in batches, and I, I met with one staff today and just kind of talking about we're going to be doing it. If we if we're if we're to asked to create lists, we're going to do it by age groupings, working from the oldest, working down. Because I think that is the I think if we're going to follow data, the data shows that's that's how that's the order we really should be um, concentrating in. And obviously, people with core mobility, <laughs> core can't say this word and I've tried it in like 17 meetings. Core mobilities are obviously already gonna be ahead of teachers anyways. So, and um, as I explained to teachers as well, <clears throat> I was on a frontier meeting today that there's gonna be a lot of different opportunities from doctor's offices, if you were a veteran, veterans offices, those other kind of things, all kind of going at once. It is kind of a mess. They're not just saying teachers wait in line here. Um, teachers at the same time could be trying to go through the either their their, their primary care position, or maybe through CVS, or you know, those other kind of ways too. So it does kind of turn into a free for all when those things kind of open up. Um, yeah, so that's kind of. But they, I really do have to say, um, I've been talking a lot with Carolyn Ness, who over, who's kind of helps lead the efforts for Franklin County, and she really wants to make sure we get teachers prioritized to get the schools open, get the kids. You know, the schools are open, but to get them even more open and and, and solid moving forward. So it's really. Um, I do have to I have to compliment her because she's really every time I'm on the phone with her, she's like, I want to get this happen. You know, you guys are in line right after the 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 um, 65 year old. So um, anyway, just want to kind of say it's a positive note. But as I said, every week feels like a month when you when we're this close, you know. So you know, we we're hoping to be doing it this week, and now we're waiting another now another another week. So thank you, Keith. So uh, no answers. No, I'm not expecting any answers right away, but um, so what What might happen once the teachers start getting vaccinated? Are we like sticking with like the hybrid schedule? Do we change that up? Like, you know, I mean, I'm sure there has to be some planning, but like what, what are we kind of thinking about once that starts to happen? Kate, it's the million dollar question, I guess. I've been having that conversation with other superintendents as well. Like what is, to me, it's, and I think I've, I've said it in a few, in a few public meetings, it's like this gray area. like. We've been all, you know, rushing and hoping to get the teachers vaccinated. Then there'll be a big exhale because those are the more vulnerable population in our school. Um, then what? You know, so you know, we're hearing across the state that they're talking about moving from six to three feet to get more students in. Um, you know, I don't have the plan drawn out yet what that can look like, um, but because I really wanted to see what the timeline is because it kind of keeps getting kind of pushed ahead. But you're right, what is it going to look like? Because we're not gonna have a, a child vaccination. I mean, they're in trial testing now, I don't know, summer, next year. 
Now there's some language in some of the latest Jesse work that says, you know, that next year we have to be prepared for multiple models. Um, it was only one line written and in one thing, which was like then one superintendent kind of sent it to everybody. Did everybody catch this this one line? Um, so, but Jesse hasn't made any decisions there yet either. So I'm hoping that the BPH is going to give us some some guidance about what the next step is. Um, I mean, I hope it, obviously it's data driven. You know, um, what is the real level of risks for students? You know, is do we treat it like chicken box where, um, you know, we start to move about? It's not, you know, things don't come to a halt when people are getting it. But we do get them out of the building and keep them away from other students. Or, you know, are we gonna continue the same mode we're in until a vaccination arrives? So. I'm going to need some outside guidance on that. Um, I think I, I don't I'm going to speak for the school committee. You're going to probably want some outside guidance on that too about what is the medical saying here about safety and such. Jenny? Yeah, and and for Sunderland specifically, as far as each individual class is concerned, and this is um, the current numbers with those students who are in the hybrid model. Um, if we were to, the, the shift would really just be an increase of in-person learning days for those for those students. Um, we um, that is unless the students who are fully remote right now opt to be doing in-person instruction. We would need the state's guidance to change from six feet to three feet. If I made sense with that at all. So the state guidance, the state guidance right now is three to six feet. So it's we stuck with the six feet as the, uh, I would say the majority of districts in Massachusetts said, you know, you started with six feet. This is what we, we agreed to. And I'm, I'm happy that we have. Um, but you're right. So um, we won't need a state guidance, but we're going to need some kind of medical kind of uh, answer on that. And you got to remember that people are homes are remote for multiple reasons. Some are the opposite where their families are more of a high risk and they don't want their child going to school because they're afraid the child's gonna bring COVID to school. Like their parents may work in the medical field. And so it kind of works both. It's not just staying at home because they didn't want to go to school to catch COVID. Some of it, some there are some people who decide the opposite way. Um, they're afraid that because they're a higher risk, um, you know, profession in the household, or maybe there's an elderly person at home as well that now is, gets vaccinated, that could free up the child to come to school. So I think Ben's absolutely right. We're gonna see a shift in student populations and that's gonna, we're gonna have to react to that. So it's an excellent question, Keith. More to come on it. So, but basically once the vaccines start rolling out, we're not gonna throw open the doors. It's just gonna be a deliberate think thought process going forward. Exactly. And it's, we will be masked through the end of the year um, and pr practicing, still practicing our PPEs and distancing and that kind of stuff, because it's still gonna be amongst the, still gonna be amongst us. And you're also not certain about, you know, um, people being carriers. And such so um you know those ppes for teachers even though they're going to be they could still be they can still get the virus they just wouldn't have the um symptoms and such of the virus with the vaccination so that's at least what they're saying now but new studies they're studying it as they're doing it so maybe two months from now they're going to say you know if you're vaccinated your chance of carrying is now whatever percentage and therefore it's a it's a deem acceptable amount but i want data on those decisions and so gotcha and and for Sunderland, we we've been at, we've been telling families that if they want to switch from the remote to the in-person model, we would need at least a week and a half um, in order to help to facilitate that. Um, but with a, a possible shift, if you know we suddenly had five people in a specific class want to shift from remote to hybrid, that's something that we would need to look at because we wouldn't necessarily be able to accommodate. Um, that many students in, in one classroom, how we have it right now. Outstanding. Um, if, if there are any other questions on, on the COVID stuff? All right, then I guess uh, uh, Kelsey has joined us and we'll get our uh, update on the uh, Anti-Racism and Equity Committee. Hey, everybody. Um, so we've got some really exciting things going on. Um, the elementary schools are continuing with their professional development this semester, focusing on curriculum. So they're looking specifically at their ELA and their social studies curriculum. Um, and they're doing that with Amanda, who was working with us last semester, and then Sapphire and Ramina from um, the Education Collect Collective in Northampton. 
Um, and they're using a tool that was developed by NYU to really go through their curriculum with a fine tooth comb and find places where they can add different things um, or just diversify the voices that they're, that they're exposing kids to. Um, so that's really exciting. It is Black History Month. Um, so the committee just sent out um, a list of resources um, and also a note to teachers kind of about how to handle Black History Month. Um, and most of the responses that we've gotten back from that have been elementary teachers saying, this is great, thank you so much, um, and also having some resources that they want, that they've been using in their classrooms that they would like to be added to the list. So that's awesome. Um, it definitely feels like the PD in the fall um, was really effective for our, our elementary school teachers, and they're really feeling motivated, um, and, and they feel like they've got some confidence um, to really start bringing this into the classroom. So that is really exciting. Um, the other thing that's really exciting that's happening right now in the high school, um, our peer leadership group, which is our, our mixed group of ninth through 12th graders, they've been hosting a series of open discussions um, every other Wednesday during the high school study hall block. So it's an optional space that students can log into specifically to talk about anti-racism topics. Um, and we've had really great turnout. We've had two so far. Um, and the students... The students have been amazing and they've been so respectful with each other. Um, and you know, not everyone has the same views, not everyone's on the same page and there have been some controversial things that have come up um, and the students have just handled it so well. They've really listened to each other and had um, just some really inspiring conversations. So moving forward in February, um, so they've, they've picked themes for each month. So January, we were just kind of starting basic, defining racism and anti-racism. Moving into February, we're gonna start tackling something a little bit more controversial. Um, we're gonna do privilege and intersectionality. Um, and then we'll keep building throughout the year. So the, this model is working really well. Um, I think it has a lot of potential for how we might start to have some of these conversations in elementary school. Um, and the peer leadership group has been approved to be an actual class for next year. So students will take it and have credit. Um, and that's really exciting from an elementary standpoint because that means we'll have a class um, with time during the day. So we can say, all right, for class today, we're going over to Sunderland and we're going to meet with this particular, you know, sixth grade class or whatever. Um, it gives us some flexibility and it gives us some time um, to really focus and engage uh, with, this, with this content and with um, interacting with the elementary schools, which we're really excited to do. Um, I think that that is kind of where we're at. I know the policy committee um, did send out their survey about um, how we handle microaggressions and incidents of racism when they come up. Um, and we got really good data from that survey. Um, there's, it's really clear that we need some more PD around what exactly is a microaggression. Um, and we do need to clarify what our policy is on how we respond um, because there were some some differing answers and differing, differing ideas of what the policy exactly is. Um, so that's really helpful. That really tells us like, awesome, that's a, that's a thing we can do. Um, so we will be moving, moving towards um, a more, a clear, clear policy of exactly how we address these things and then bringing some microaggression PD in. I'm happy to answer questions if anyone's got any. And Kelsey, just to add to that last point, I was actually having a discussion with a couple of staff members the other day exactly about that. You know, for our anti-bullying procedures and policies, we have a step-by-step -step sequence we go through um, when a potential bullying incident takes place. Um, but we don't have that for a microaggression or a racist incident. So having having that on board would be really helpful, um, you know, for, for everyone involved. Yes. And we were also on the, the curriculum committee, we were also talking about how those incidents can actually help us inform how we change our, our curriculum. Um, so like, yes, there's the immediate response of the discipline and the education piece, but then that also gives us data of, oh, okay, we just had an incident with, with the Confederate flag. That tells us we need to be talking about the history of the Confederate flag more in our classrooms. Uh, and then we can add that to our curriculum and have that be a more long-term solution in addition to, you know, the immediate band-aid of the kids that were affected right then. Outstanding. Keith? I guess I just got a, a quick comment and then a question. Um, I appreciate 
Kelsey and, and Ben and the teachers of work that you're doing. Um, I think that this work, uh, I, I haven't heard any problems with it, but I do know that uh, in other places around the state, it has not gone as smoothly. Um, there has been some distinct pushback from members of the community. So I, I'm, I hope that it has gone smoothly here, but um, just to bring up that, that we're engaging in hard work. Um, and then just the question would be, I would be appreciative if maybe as we go to May, June, um, I guess this would be more to Ben, not having one or two teachers join us at some point and talk about maybe some of the curricular changes that they have done. Not, not nothing really huge, but maybe just like they would, sometimes they work in isolation. It'd be really good to hear the work that they're doing individually in the class um, for the curricular change. Yes, I agree. That would be really wonderful to hear from them. Um, and there, I mean, there has been a little bit of pushback. Um, not, not a ton, not as much as we were sort of bracing for. Um, but it's, it's true that some people do have sort of a visceral reaction and do sort of feel like, oh, this is political and you, we shouldn't be teaching politics in school. Um, and we just keep bringing it back to, you know, we're not teaching politics. We're teaching um, that we should, you know, have respect for each other as human beings. And that, sh that should be a universal value that we all share. Yeah, I, would, I, have a, uh, I have an associate in the eastern part of the state that things were going really, really badly. Mm. And... I think it's a it's misunderstanding, like, yeah, this idea that we are teaching politics or they are teaching politics, and that's not the case. It's, it's, it's trying to build empathy and have greater understanding. And, and I think there's a misunderstanding outside. So let's just try to bring that one. Outstanding. Any other questions, comments? Outstanding. Well, thank you, Kelsey. It sounds like... Uh, Fantastic stuff and, and being well received. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right. And now back to the, the fun of the fiscal year 22 budget proposal discussion. Oh my gosh, we are going to have so much fun. You ready? <laughs> Darius, do you want to share your screen? <laughs> Oh, thank you. I just got to catch my, that was very good, Shelly. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I did send you all a report I shared with you. Darius is going to share a screen. I didn't send a full budget document again because it's really a work in progress, but the numbers are reflected here um, from what we're going to talk about. It, it matches the spreadsheet, um, but there's just been so many variations that I didn't want to overwhelm you with, you know, a lot of different spreadsheets. So. Um, the top information here is just a reminder, you know, that's the amount of, of what a 1%, a 2%, 3 4 or 5% increase would look like. And then uh, Darius will scroll down a little bit. Um, we started with the first draft when we met. That was at 8.98%. Um, we had talked about retirement wages not being included in that number, um, and that is coming in at about a $50,000 um, payout for next year for Sunderland Elementary, which brings our total percentage up to 10.63. So that was the only major addition to uh, the second draft, if you want to call it a second draft. Um, there might have been some minor tweaks here and there, but that was really the most significant thing. Um, so coming into this meeting, we wanted to talk about some options to reduce the budget. So we have two things here. Um, this looks slightly different than what we shared last night because um, as school committee will know, Peter sent out some thoughts. Thank you as always for sending those ahead of time because it gives um, Darius and I some time to process and see if we uh, wanna add anything to the presentation. So there is um, some addition here as an option B for us to talk about. Um, but the first step in both options, um, looking at option A first is the 21 budget freeze, which we've done. Uh, we're looking at about 87,000 from what I've calculated right now of uh, budget savings that we can reallocate our school choice expenses back to the general fund. Um, I do anticipate that there uh, could be a greater increase here. There's certain accounts that I didn't look at yet. For example, um, our substitute teaching line still has about 28,000 in it. It, but I don't want to pull any money from there because it's too early in the year. Although we're not going to spend all of that given the structure that Ben has set up for class coverage. We don't have a lot of subs coming into the building. 
Um, so that's just one example. So I do expect that number to grow. And if anyone has questions about what that number is comprised of, I'm, I'm happy to give you um, more information on that before we keep going. Nothing? Okay. Um, so then our, our second recommendation would be to uh, use additional school choice funds uh, to help cover the one-time out-of-district placement that we talked about for next year, which is an $80,000 increase. Uh, and then from there, step three would be to request that the town cover those retirement expenses for us in a, in a special warrant. Um, I understand that this has been done in the past, um, and this may be something that they might be interested in discussing with us instead of having a budget increase uh, and then the fourth step would be a personnel reduction and that piece really isn't looked at at this point in here so you can see what the snapshot financially looks like so we have that 87,000 in savings this year that we're going to put into school choice and then spend that money right down um, and then the 80,000 uh, backing out for the out of district placement because we're going to put that back on school choice and then the retirement warrant payout. So that would bring our increase down to 3.31 um, if we were to take all of these steps. And because there's such a significant impact on the school choice numbers with this, I did wanna show you what those projections would look like. Um, so you can see here in draft two, looking at ending the year with 174,000. Um, after that 87,000, it's a wash because we're putting it in and then we're taking it right back out. So that bottom line doesn't change. But if you look at the expense number, the expense number is what increases. We're going from 425 to 513. Um, the revenue does also go up there and that revenue uh, will carry over to the third projection that's here. Um, but that's also increasing expenses by another 80,000 to cover that out of district placement. So we'd be looking at ending the year at 94,000 if we did go ahead with plan A. Now that's a lot of information. There is. Yeah, the only thing I want to just kind of throw in there, and, and this is not, I know most of the school committee understands this, but it, it gets it gets kind of confusing when we say we take the savings and we put it into school choice, and then we use school choice money to pay down other areas. So our revenue of school choice is down. And so while it appears we keep supplementing it by cutting other portions of the budget, taking that money because we're allowed to put the money into school choice spend less school choice money and then carry that money forward. I just want to make sure everybody understands that that concept, um, what's going on there, because that's where it gets kind of confusing because we're not, you know, it, 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 to, me, it, to me, I sometimes get myself kind of confused on that and have to kind of readjust myself because those revenues are actually down this year in school choice and we're eating away, not only at the school choice, but we're using our own budget to supplement the following year budget. Okay, and we've been doing that now we're looking at, in this particular model, we're gonna look at another model in a second. We've done that two years in a row. We came to last year with a level funded budget. We used all our savings from the prior year by cutting, literally, when we say freeze, it's a nice way of saying we're cutting the budget. And then we're taking the cuts of that budget that we should have spent on programming and such for that year and pushing it forward. But we keep on saying we're putting in school choice, which is very different than what's happening in some of our other neighboring districts that actually have more school choice money and they're not, it's not, they're not kind of swapping in just savings in that, they have actually more school choice money. So, is it, they, they say that right, Shelly, and any questions out there? I can't see, well, actually, I can see. Is I'll, I'll ask. Wait, move on. Yeah, so, so Darius, you just pointed out uh, a really good point, which is uh, we're having a freeze on a freeze, which is effectively a cut after a cut. I'm just interested uh, in hearing from Ben uh, what it's like, you know, looking at, at that going forward um, concerns. In, in terms of the budget freeze, is, is that what, sorry, is that, is that yeah. what you're asking right now? Yeah, I'm, I'm essentially asking, uh, I, I think you've had, or Shelly wants to, to speak to it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we're not really cutting anything at this point with the, I mean, there could be some things that we have to still purchase, but we're really talking about, and this is 
similar to what Darius is saying, we're talking about manipulating some of our funding sources in a way that frees up our money to be used primarily to pay for wages. So part of that $87,000 is actually that Ben and I looked at um, grant funding that's available and how we can use some of the grant money that's left this year um, to pay for some of the wages. And, you know, there were some grants that him and I looked at and said, you know what, we need, the grant has 30,000 left, we need 20,000 to do X, Y, Z. We cannot sacrifice that. Um, but these were maybe some other things that would have been extra. So, you know, we're not necessarily cutting, we're not cutting staffing, we're not cutting any programming. Um, we really looked at ways that we could utilize one, other funding sources, and then two, the savings that exist in the budget already. So for example, there was a personnel change this year that generated a significant amount of money. Um, when I say significant, it's between the transportation and the personnel change, it's about $30,000 of that 87,000 that we're talking about. So those two pieces alone were a big chunk. And then I went in and looked at other things, money that we're not really going to spend. For example, I spent quite a bit of time utilize, or not utilizing, um, analyzing uh, um, every account line. So in the finance function code, what money are we not going to use there? That pulled in a little bit more money. Um, we're not doing field trips, but there is, you know, 7,000 almost in the budget for field trips. So it was sort of looking at those accounts first, where we didn't actually have to cut any programming or cut any staffing to see how we could pull from those accounts that weren't going to have an impact on the actual educational experience. Um, now, that doesn't mean that things like supplies and materials aren't going to be affected, but again, you know, Ben has some discretion here with the spending that, you know, if a, a teacher or um, administrator or clerical or whoever it is says, God, we really can't live without this, Ben can still say, okay, we're going to go ahead and buy this. So the first step in this freeze has really been about seeing what funds are available that wouldn't have an impact negatively on the education experience that we're providing. And, that and a lot of Greg? thank you. Yes, a, a lot of the supplies that we've purchased this year um, came through the grants that we received at the beginning of the school year, the CARES Act. So, you know, from a technology standpoint, um, remote learning materials, a lot of that, a lot of those supplies came from those grants, which would normally come from the the operating budget. Yeah, I guess I, I was just. Uh... I'm impressed that we're already at at around 3.3 because I know sometimes we've we've had a lot of trouble and it's it's been a very chaotic year and it's it clearly things are uh, it's a completely different year in terms of things that you used to spend money on you don't and you do spend money on things that you didn't used to. So you spoke too quickly there, Greg, because we want to explain the other side the other side of the coin here, which is is what we added to this. Um, Shall you um, put some work in today? In looking at the fact that if we have school, if we have school choice at the end of this year, we are basically kicking the can down the road, and we're going to be crushed next year because you know we, you know, we we have growth, we have natural growth in our budget um, through you know cola increases and, and other expenses, and we keep on using school choice, which revenues are going down, and so if we push this further down. Um, you know, Shelly's going to explain the next kind of phase, which I think Peter had outlined in an email, which gave us kind of the idea that the question we're going to have for the school committee is, how do we want to approach this year? And so, let's let's have, Shelly, I'm going to have you explain the next year, so then that'll get people's minds kind of going there, and um, so forth. Yeah, and the 3.3 .3 that we're at right now is, it's really, you know hypothetical, right? Because the town would have to agree to pay that 50,000 in the retirement. So, you know, still a moving target, but this, these were just the ideas to get started. So um, as Darius said, we added in um, another option here for us to consider with um, Peter's comments, a um, little bit of an explanation. So school choice expenses increased this year, $168,000 over the prior year. This was possible because of additional revenue received. If you remember, we got um, additional SPED increments at the end of last year, and then we reallocate all of those expenses that we just talked about above. 
So what I really looked at is, okay, how much of the savings from last year did we use to offset this year's budget? And it's about $100,000 that we reduced um, in school choice savings. So that allowed us to level fund. So again, there's that supplementing of the current year's budget with a budget freeze money from last year. And it's really just moving around. Like Darius said, it's not an increase in revenue. Um, so essentially that should be a one year increase to those school choice accounts. And those expenses should be put back on the local budget for FY22. The original draft does not account for that. If it did, we'd be looking at an additional roughly 3%. So that 10.63 would be approximately 13.63. So it's really a good spot. Go should, ahead. should we just pause there to make sure everybody understands exactly what you just said there? Because it is, I've looked at it all afternoon with you, so I understand it. Does everybody follow that? Because it's in the sense of where we're moving that kind of money? Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to pause only because it is, if you don't understand that step, then you don't understand the next one. That's right. Um, so we use the 13.63 as the starting point because if we continue to deplete school choice funds, we are going to be in the same position next year. So the steps are similar here. We continue with the budget freeze. Um, we continue with the 80,000 out of district placement. We, we go to the town and ask for that special warrant. And then step four, which is really not discussed again, is the personnel reduction, but putting that in there, that might be one of the things that we have to talk about. So what does that financial snapshot look like? Um, there's, if you scroll down a little bit. So that brings us to a 6.65. Essentially, we're adding $100,000 to um, our budget here because we're moving those expenses that we paid in choice this year that hadn't been paid in choice before back to the local where they used to be paid from so it's increasing us about 100,000. So we're going from 13.63 as our starting point, same reductions that we discussed above to bring us to 6.65, you know, roughly. Those are just kind of some rough math there. The key with this is how this impacts school choice in a different way. So a lot of these numbers don't change. Um, and I'm sorry it's not on one page. Maybe I should... Um, if you're sharing your screen, does it update? Yep. Is that moving right now? Yep. Did it move it down? Okay. That way we can look at it um, in one spot. So you can see here, the big change here is in this expense line. The, the rollovers don't change. The revenues don't change. All of that looks exactly the same. But you'll see that the expenses are reduced um, because we moved that 100000 back to the local budget. And in the end, in this third column here, um, it gives us at the end of the year, 194,000 versus the 94,000 that we talked about in option A. So um, questions before I keep going? No, okay. Shall we? So, yes. Um, just while you've got this little chart here, I would just point out that um, I mean, part of the reason I wrote you a couple of emails was that I blanched when I saw the first chart that showed us getting down to 94000 end of year for school choice it, it, at the end of a year where we were spending over 500000 okay, and ending so low, and it's just absolutely totally unsustainable, okay? Uh, this number, this looks, on first glance, sort of similar because you've got a case where you've got four in the right hand column here you taking in 346,000 you're spending 493 uh that's not a good trend okay the 194 is certainly a whole lot better but the reason that that's actually okay is because part of what you're spending is on the 80,000 for the out of district placement okay and that's a one year only thing okay because you know to me we got that to one year only thing and school lunch costs were and and uh early childhood costs, okay, are also uh, may go away to some extent, okay? We don't know. Um, and so that's another place where the this would close up this difference between revenue and expense that we're looking at now. So that, um, you know, I, I, I think something like this is is much more responsible than, certainly than the other one, and certainly also than it looks on first glance. 
Yeah, so let's talk about the, the differences here and, and a little without looking at the numbers. Um, Darius, if you scroll down a little bit, please. Um, so like we've said already, and, and Peter just said, um, you know, school choice funds have been supplementing the local budget. And this is prior to the past two years. You know, I look back pretty historically and we have been, um, you know, spending, if not all of the revenue coming in a little bit more for several years. So this isn't a new thing. It's gotten worse with COVID for sure, but not, not new. Um, but the problem is, as Peter just explained, that choice expenses are exceeding choice revenue year after year. And the model is not sustainable. We can't continue to spend 400 plus thousand if we're only bringing in 350,000 in revenue. It's just, it's not something that can hold us. If we had a million dollars in school choice, we'd be having a little bit of a different conversation, but we don't. Um, so option A results in a lower budget increase, which might um, look better to especially the select board and other members of the town and the community. Um, when we're talking about presenting a budget, but it eats into the school choice reserves to bring that budget down. And it ultimately, again, only addresses the financial issue for one additional year. Um, without a change in choice expenses and only 95,000 in reserves, we're gonna face the same challenge going into FY23. And, and, and so I, option B, oh, go ahead. Oh, the only other thing I also wanna put in there is that it also, puts us at a very higher risk. So we go in there with no backup money to any other problems that come, changes in education, demands that we have. And we, you know what I mean? You just, you have no money in your wallet at all um, and you're going on a road trip. You know what I mean? So, and that's really, um, so kicking it down, I guess the question I'm gonna be asking the committee is, why would we kick it down for another year? And I think that's what Peter, I'm taking Peter's point and looking good with it. Um, but, you know, the question is, I think as a committee, we have to decide is, you know, you know, yes, we could, we could have a lower percentage this year, but is that really the right thing to do? We should correct this when, when things are stable enough in our budgets to, to do that rather than next year when it's going to be complete, you know, you're going to be, a, we're going to be in a panic kind of budget season where this is kind of not as much panic because we're going to have some cushions, um, on different end. When I say cushion, not fluffy cushions, just some, some safety cushions. Mm -hmm. And, and it was already discussed. It was already discussed, but one of those um, reductions in the the, the draft budgets here um, came from the the grants, and those might not always be available as well. Yeah, we're really kind of set up right now not for long term success. Um, and with option B, uh, the school choice reserve is higher, but it presents an increase. Um, in the overall budget of 6.65%, which really isn't ideal, but um, if we continue to eat away at those reserves, again, it's it's not gonna help us for these one-time things that come up. Um, you know, and, and with B, like Peter was saying, uh, it's not gonna be a one-year fix. So if we were to get a 6.65% budget approved by with the town, and you know, this is the route that you all wanted to go, we're not looking at this problem being resolved. We're adding 87,000 this year to school choice because we have savings um, from 21, but in 23, in order to prevent the same problem from happening, we're gonna have to do like we're talking about right now, that 100 grand that we added this year, moving back the next year, it'll be the same thing with the 87,000 in fiscal year 23. And that's really just kind of getting us back to a point where we might be, um, spending what we're bringing in, but you know, my I would like us encourage you all to start looking more long term and um, not just at the current year, and encourage the select board to be helping us in that process um, so that we can build a budget that meets the school needs and gives us reserves so that when retirement payouts come up, out of district placements come up, um, we're really set up to be financially successful rather than kind of just putting band-aids on things year after year. I know it's a lot of information. Um, there's a couple of other points just to add on here before we start discussion is 
early childhood and school lunch, you know, we keep talking about them as being challenging this year. They're going to be challenging again next year, but there may be an increase in revenues that could support additional wages. It's far too early to even have those discussions. And I still think we have to be prepared to cover all of our staffing needs with other funding sources. But it may be something that um, even after budgets are approved, we could make a decision to shift things around and put some things back on those revolving funds that we've pulled off to free up either school choice or general fund money for other things. Um, so that's a conversation we'll have to continue ha having. Um, and then the last point is that there is a lot of talk right now about um, additional CARES Act funding. So there is a grant that was just released by DESE called the ESSER II. Um, with the ESSER I, Sunderland received, I believe, only $20,000 because it was based on, on Title I. So there was a minimum amount. My understanding is that they changed the formula for the ESSER II um, and that Sunderland would be eligible for more money. However, um, I don't have enough info from the state yet. There is a webinar later this week and again next week to try to gain some more information on that to see if we could really use that to help offset some of our challenges. But again, like Ben pointed out, um, and with the school choice, anytime we're using grant money, it's not necessarily going to be there next year um, or in future years to help us out. And we're really kind of of borrowing from one pot of money to cover another pot of money and it's just not the best practice and I'd love to shift our uh, mindset around some of these things as we plan and go through the next couple of years. Whew. Thoughts, questions, comments, questions, comments oh, yeah. guidance, how do we move forward? Do have uh, an invitation to attend the select board meeting, right, Darius, on the twenty second of this month. I I'm, looking at my calendar. I'm looking at my calendar to make sure that I'm correct on that. Yes. Go ahead, Ben. I, and I'm not sure if, but did we talk about pushing that back as well? I know I sent the two of you that invite, but. Um, I'm just not sure where the, the latest is if we're actually meeting that date. Peter? Um, so far, the select board has been progressing with its budget hearings on normal schedule. Okay. However, they've also postponed town meeting till second week in June. So that, uh, um, you know, it's sort of, <laughs> it's a little strange. But anyway, I mean, it's strange because I look at it and I say, well, the governor's budget out there, you know, there ought to be a local aid resolution, be, you know, in, in the normal course of events. And at that point, one can go ahead and just on a normal budget schedule. But um, they've already postponed town meetings. So I guess that's the way it's going to be. Um, you know, I would say we should just go ahead and keep to that schedule because, you know, part of what I see as our, you know, going to those, going to that meeting is the, you know, not just to say, well, here's the nuts and, butts, nuts and bolts of what we're proposing in a budget, but it's also like to review, you know, sort of, you know, the bigger picture. And the, one of the things in the bigger picture is how we've been through this school choice crises and we don't want to go back there. And they've agreed with us in the past because we've had this, discussion. I mean, a couple of years ago, we had a serious discussion about that. And so last year when we put in the budget more of a cushion, for year-end school choice, there was no objection to that, okay? And I think that, you know, we just have to remind them that, yeah, this is what we're trying to do, which is called good good management. Um, and secondly, having been through this year with a flat budget, you know, level funded from the town, then to go back and ask for basically more, this, you know, the next year strikes me as like totally okay. Totally okay. I don't know how it'll end up, but I think that, boy, it'd be foolish not to go forward with a, with a bigger number and not to feel any compunction at all about, oh, you've got to come in with two or three percent because otherwise, you know, you're not being responsible. I mean, we basically, we, we ended up biting the bullet for FY21 where it turned out, in effect, not to have been necessary. Okay. And that's, and that's just the truth of the matter. 
okay? Because the things that they were saying are going to happen, which is 20% cut in Chapter 70 money, 20% cut in general government money from the state. We got a plan on all that. Neither one happened. Okay, so I think that, uh, you know, if I saw a reason that we ought to go in at 8 eight or 10%, I'd recommend it. But I think actually something like we got here at 6.5%, boy, that's right in the ballpark of where we ought to be. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, go ahead, Keith. Yeah, so to kind of echo what Peter was saying in terms of the budget planning, I know uh, uh, police fire library have done budget proposals, but Franklin County Tech postponed there. So they pushed it off. Um, I think communication, bringing whatever we have forward and, and, and talking so that they know our planning is the best option. And then the thing that I always keep hearing um, is they want a responsible budget. They want, you know, no new revenues without um, recurring, no, no recurring uh, expenditures on temporary revenues. They, they don't want, you know, a, a false budget. So I think the option B is presenting them the real nuts and bolts of what we're looking at. And it's a responsible proposal. And I think it's, it's one that's honest and it's not playing with money. And, and for my entire time on the school committee, it's always been about trying to get the school choice right so i i'm leaning towards that the option b i'm I, i'm i'm all in on option b good deal any other my only my only comment on the timeline you know i know they're, they're they pushed up their timeline there's a part of me that says i hear you town but we're 60 percent of your budget and we don't know what next year looks like so we have more time and since 60 percent since of your budget needs a little bit more time maybe you know we can have those conversations you know i think we need on 22nd and show them where we're at but frontier is not going to be in a spot where we're going to be anywhere near to talk about we're going to have some you know number you may have some basic overall um you know uh, estimates of where things might be at but we're not going to know all those kind of things ironed out yet so it's kind of like it's prudent to take our time on this because you know we're going to be able to see what next year brings. We're going to have a better understanding of our revenue accounts, our rolling, you know, those kind of things. I said this before, so I won't go into a long thing. But so I think that we also need to kind of push a little bit there and say, listen, I understand you want this up and done, but there's a reason why you're pushing off your meetings. And let's take advantage of it. <clears throat> yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, but on the other hand, I think it's you know just in terms of of continuing a serious conversation about this stuff okay which is what we've been trying to do okay so that they understand you know, always if i look at the, the 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 question about the retirement money and why getting a special article uh and you know that was approved last time it came up they, they were totally happy to do that you know why they were happy to do it because they didn't trust us okay if we put it in the budget they didn't trust us that we wouldn't just leave it there you know for following years and it would never come out so if you put it as a separate article that way they know you know we haven't fooled them um so there's still that sort of feeling um and i think actually in this case we take advantage of it by saying great you know i know you don't you know you're always unsure about that so we'll put this out in a separate warrant we got to pay it one way or another this way you know it's not getting hidden in our budget um but i think this sort of conversation about um you know what we're presenting so on yeah let's get it started um and i don't think it's not like do you two more weeks is going to make us suddenly you know going from not knowing anything to knowing lots i mean it's lord knows when we're going to find out some of this stuff we're not going to know i don't think we're going to know more about you know what's happening with school lunch early childhood or you know a bunch of stuff um we're just going to have to do go with what we got and and be flexible down the road and that's what you guys have been doing all year Is there, would there be any way to frame it instead of a, uh, a budget presentation as just a budget date? You can let them know kind of where we're at rather than giving a full presentation because we are, we're not going to know until the state comes out. So I think they understand that. And, you know, with Franklin County Tech just outright canceling and pushing it off, I think um, just, just open communication is good. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, I agree with what you said, Peter, and if I came off as uh, not wanting to have a conversation, that's not what I meant. I, I think we I, I think we should have a meeting on the 22nd, talk about where the elementary school is. I'm also just saying that Frontier is not going to be able to, 
is also another piece of the pie, and then Frontier's not going to be ready yet. Okay. And so we, we should talk about what we're, we're thinking and planning here and have that open communication. I'm just saying that the final product of that conversation, we shouldn't be in a rush to wrap it up a week later, which is kind of like our normal timeline, um, and just kind of see what these, you know, what we're going to get for funding and, and so forth. And maybe it will be at 90%, and, you know, we just have to put a bow on it at the end. I don't know. Go ahead, Peter. Um, I'm assuming that we still need to uh, we'll still need to vote at our March meeting on uh, adopting a budget and have a public hearing at that point. If if they moved town meeting, does it still have to be March? I'm going to have to get all the legal update on that because I believe. So you don't need the timeline like Frontier does. Frontier is a regional agreement that says you have to have it so many days, 45 days prior to the first town meeting. Right. Um, I believe that that's the language. I'm going to have to double check that, but I don't believe we have to have a public hearing on the budget 30 days before. So we'll have to get the, I'll get the numbers on that. I think we're, I think you can shift the whole thing though. It makes sense. Right. But I'll find out. Outstanding. Excellent question. Yeah, that sounds right that it's it's based off the uh, the town meeting. So we can certainly present the data that we have. All right. Um, Do you want any sort of vote on going forward, at least to that meeting with this, or we just got, seems like there's no objection. Yeah, I, I mean, again, this is uh, just a, a, a presentation and uh, I, I agree with everything that everyone has said that uh, this is what they're asking for. They, they want options. They want to know the straight truth. They want to know, uh, they'd be mad at us if we buried this expense and then they caught up with them next year and they'd say, well, why didn't you tell us? So a hundred percent, this is, this is the right number to, to present that meeting. I, I don't see a, a vote on the agenda and, uh, unless you want. There's not, a, there's not a vote on the agenda. You, you don't really need to vote a draft because the draft is so vague in which we were going. You're just going to say that, you know, however, I would want guidance. I, because I, I'm going to say I want it. I know Shelly's going to want it too. What do you want us to sh basically share this document on the 22nd? We can clean it up a little bit. Um, do you want to show both? I mean, they can watch this thing so they can see both A and B, but do yeah. we really want to talk about, is it too much information? Kind of give me some some ground there. Peter? Yeah, Peter. Yeah, I think that you ought to just uh, present the the one with the numbers that we're going with. Okay, I don't think you need to start. I think if you present the, the the what your option your plan A was that that just it's it's just adds a whole bunch of numbers, many of which are the same, but so it just makes it more confusing. You just start to say, well, uh, you ask for level services. Well, level services means, uh, you know, the only thing that we basically added is the one teacher, and that's still level services because we have to have a teacher for every classroom, so that's not an increase. Okay. And then the rest is all these strange things that have been happening this year of COVID. And, you know, the out of district placement, the school lunch stuff, the early childhood stuff, and the fact that you asked us, you know, last year we had to fund the, um, the COLA and the step increases with uh, school choice money because we had a flat budget. And then just, just present the one set of figures and this is what we need this year to run the program. Thank you. Yeah. Could there be any sense to switching the order of options A and B? I mean, I'm, I'd say just present the one option B. Okay. Yeah, I think I just, you agree with that, Jessica? I think he's saying pull out option A. It's just confusing. Let's talk about option B. Right. Um, That's good. A lot of the numbers are the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I also yeah. think it's important to have the conversation that we're all aware of and really start to dive into tonight that this isn't a one year problem. They might see another 6% budget next year where it's going to take us a couple of years to get in the right spot. Yeah, I, that's absolutely uh, what they need to hear. And, uh, you know, to the point you already did the homework on option A. So if they ask, well, what if that were just a really big number this year and, and we couldn't, you, you sort of know the what if, right? That, that you're just kicking the can down, you're making it worse next year. Yeah, and I think, right, and we have to break the cycle because what's going to happen next year is we'll have a year where we're like, oh, you should use some of that school choice money that you 
you put into reserve and then you can knock down that budget and you can be in the same and then a year, you, know, you start the cycle again and that's the kind of thing you're good deal um if we're good on that then i guess the uh uh going once twice all good okay uh new business review of the nesdaq enrollment projections so we we get this every year as we're part of nesdaq um i have little to no faith in any of those numbers <laughs> I mean, if you look at, you know, I know Frontier's numbers even better just having lived it for the last 13 years. They have us projected within 2024 having um, like hundreds more students in, a, in our district overall, adding 300 students in the next three years. That, that's not happening. Right now, we're, we're going to try to rec we're going to try to bounce back from the amount of students we lost um, that went to either homeschool and may stay homeschool. We looked at private options this year, may not come back, you know, that kind of thing. I think. Um, you know, it's interesting looking at, just kind of giving you my summary of it and you can kind of go through and pull out what you want. It's interesting birth trends and that kind of stuff, but Sunderland's a tough community to look at because you have birth trends and then for housing, they move out of town when they, when the you know, students get to a certain age or they had a birth when they were attending college or, you know, whatever's going on. So they have not been predictable throughout the years. Um, I don't think I've ever used it as a data source um, to help make a decision moving forward. Just outside of this looking at and going, huh, that's interesting. Um, so I give it to you with that. I didn't apply any more in depth other than just kind of looking through it and trying to find something from it. That's it. Peter? <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to ask Ben, what sort of numbers did we end up getting from the new housing development on 116? Very few. We might be at uh, five students right now. I wonder what they did with all those affordable apartments that, you know, who knows? Okay. I mean, that's certainly, I mean, we, we whatever. I thought, you know, it looked like we were going to get a lot bigger number, but I, I had the feeling that it was quite low based on just not hearing anything about it. Yeah. It's college kids. Yeah. Uh, has a question? Go ahead. Just, just because I remember seeing these with Frontier a couple of years ago, and then just are we paying for that? The uh, the the Nesda, whatever that is. We pay, we do pay uh, annual fee as a full district. Is it really worth it? I mean, is, is it question. worth it? To, is it so small that it really doesn't matter? It's or is it is it just something that we really don't need? You know, I'll I'll get the breakdown of the total cost. I, I think it's I think it's like a thousand dollars for the entire membership. Um, and we don't use them for other things like average, you know, I get NASDAQ, you know, updates that they're looking for a principal or looking for a superintendent and they kind of do that as well, advertising that kind of stuff. We haven't used them for that as well. Um, you know, we'll look into that. Maybe it's something we find some money. Outstanding. I do have to get everybody else to agree though. All right. Well, if we're done with that, then uh, let's see. Uh, reports. Do we have any committee reports? All right. How about uh, the uh, collaborative? Okay, go ahead, Peter. Uh, there's a capital planning committee meeting tomorrow evening. Um, Darius is, is, I guess I should send an email to Bill to make sure he's going to show up for that. Or can you check with him or? Right. You guys, and I and I, I respond to that that I have I have Deerfield tomorrow night. Yeah. Shelley has Deerfield right. tomorrow night, so neither one of us will be there, but I can see if Bill can make it so he can go through that. Okay. Because they'll be yeah. they'll be going over, you know, there'll be one information on the specific projects. Outstanding. Ben, I don't know if you want to stop in. Um, what times? Yeah, po possibly. What times the meeting? Six o'clock, and the and the and the information, the Zoom information, is on. You go to the town website, the town calendar, look on the calendar, click on the event, and then the Zoom inf information is there. Outstanding. All right. 
and the principal's report. Whoa, whoa, time out. Oh, sorry. I spent two hours and 45 minutes at a collaborative meeting. I'm not, I just, he's, yeah. uh, <laughs> it. Oh, it, it, I, they're very frustrating. I don't know what half of what's going on at those meetings, especially when they go over the budgets. It's just like, because they have so many different budgets, I mean, for the different schools they're operating. So I'll just give it really quick. They are operating at a significant loss and they're dealing with the same thing that we're dealing because they have low enrollment and they've had revenue loss. Um, they're trying to avoid layoffs. They're going to be raising membership rates at some point upwards of 5%. They're trying to go maybe a, a percent a year. Uh, there was uh, a number of uh, strategic plan presentations, anti-racism presentations. Uh, they're looking for a new director. They've had like 90 applicants and they're going to, work, they want to have more meetings and further collaboration and, and breakout rooms and having us meet with each other and, and more meetings. So uh, it's always an interesting meeting. That's all I got. I thought policy committee was tough. Wow. All right. Uh, thank you for that, Keith, and, and your hard work there. All right, Ben? Yeah, so uh, we were scheduled to uh, build the early childhood playground today, but then we had the snowstorm, so that's since been uh, pushed back again. So my apologies for that. Um, but no, in all seriousness, this past weekend, I did su submit the CPA grant application to the town. Um, when speaking with committee members leading up to the submission, they said, just put everything out there. So I, I, I put the entire project um, in, in the application, um, knowing that the, the CPC can't, um, would not be able to accommodate the, the full amount of the actual budget. Um, we are looking at ways to continue to bring down the costs and um, those are being solidified. It's just some of the costs are, it's, it's not entirely sure. We're not entirely sure what that actual price will be. So for example, in the spreadsheet, um, Berkshire Design Group was saying that the removal of the safety surface and the play equipment was going to be between 15 and $20,000. Well, we, we have, we've had one company, um, volunteer to take to take away the safety equipment or excuse me the playground equipment um, I just don't know what it will cost to take that out um, we have had another company say they'll take all the um, the loam and the p-stone away I just don't know how much it will cost to ship it um, to that to that space so we're getting there um, we're, we're moving forward we will be applying for the municipality ADA grant next fall as well as well so we, we are making progress. Outstanding. I'm impressed. Any other? <laughs> Thanks, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> all, <right. laughs> all this COVID stuff, and there's still, uh, I, that, was, that was one of the, like, well, we're, we're not going to get, that's going to get kicked down the road, but you're still going at it. That's, that's outstanding. Um, anything else? Uh, you're, you're all set. So on to the superintendent's report. Oh, go ahead, Peter. Just quick, quick thing for Ben. Um, it just strikes me that it really actually might be worth your time. Spend five minutes at our capital planning committee tomorrow evening, bringing them up to date on what you're doing with the CPA. It just is another way to, you know, build support. Yeah, and you know the the initial cost of the playground was quoted at four hundred ten thousand, and that's assuming um, no volunteer work, no in kind donations. Um, no, no breaks from local local businesses that would be possibly doing some of the construction. Um, when I met with Berkshire Design Group last week, the overall cost of the num uh, playground right now is projected to be around three hundred fifty thousand. That's through working with them to change up some of the play structures um, so that they're not expensive, so, so they're not as expensive, and and or um replacing what was on the initial draft with something that's similar as well um but yeah i'd be happy to fill them in about that good outstanding all right darius i've already kind of given you a summary of what's going on so in that case uh I'll Go ahead, Peter. 
Oh uh, yeah, I got a, something to bring up, and that is that the uh, uh, Maisie and I, I believe, are in the last uh, year of our terms, and the schedule is that the uh, first there's a caucus, which I think you're probably familiar with, um, to make sure that uh, they have a person, you know, for each spot, uh, and that's been moved. It has. It would have been on a Monday evening, the first Monday in March. It's now been moved. Uh, I think it's to the last Saturday in February. It's going to be an outdoor car meeting at uh, 4 p.m. behind Town Hall. I think was it, unless I got it wrong. It was either 10 p.m. or 4 p.m. I can't remember which now. My uh, family says 10 a.m. 10 a.m., I'm sorry. 10 a.m., that was what it was. I was thinking town meeting, whatever. The caucus is going to be the last Saturday in February at 10 a.m. Um, and so then, um, oh, I don't know, Maisie, I don't know what you're interested in doing. So I just let Wendy know uh, late last night that I am not going to be running again. Okay. And yeah, and thank you so much for all you've done so far. And there'll be more of that later, but uh, I totally understand. Um, and I, honestly, God, I would like to stop, um, yeah. because it's, I'm getting old for this and it's getting a lot and I feel a lot of stress and that's not good for me. And, um, I mean, I come up with a number of reasons, but then I sort of also think, you know, with the pension we could find as replacements. And, um, I also think that. You know, part of, I mean, the main couple of reasons that I would have for not continuing would be number one is the stress, which I which I struggle with in a number of things, and uh, obviously I'm getting old, so I'm getting sort of senile too. But um, also the fact that it, I really try to make meetings, and therefore, you know, particularly after COVID's open over, we hope to do some traveling. We might like to go, go south for part of the winter. You know, who knows what, um, and this sort of ties my hand some because I try to take it responsibly, try to come to me, you know, show up and so on. So, um, you know, if I was to keep doing it, it would be with the understanding that there might be times when I say, okay, I'm going to miss this meeting because something's more important. Um, and, you know, if we can find, you know, someone else that, you know, apparently already looking for one, it depends what we could find. But, you know, it might be worth asking around. And I particularly think that in terms of, you know, the stuff that was going on now with the anti-racism stuff, that if we could find some, you know, add some more diversity to this committee, that would certainly be a worthwhile thing. But I don't know how we start going about looking. And you guys are much more connected with people at the school than I am. So might have some ideas. Yeah, great points. Um, and I know, uh, you know, I mean, there's the PTO. I know that uh, we got to build this pipe, right? Where where we bring in people who are currently parents and, and more uh, tied into what's going on. Uh, so, yeah. Any any thoughts, ideas, how to reach out? PTO. I mean, word of mouth is the number one way. I think yep. you start talk to someone who knows somebody and. It's gonna be tough losing both of you guys in the same year. Absolutely. I haven't made up my mind for sure. And I obviously I don't have much time, but I sort of, you know, wanted to run it by here and then also see what, you know, what the options are. Well, I, I thought the two of you had said you would see the early childhood playground project out, and that's gonna be another three to five years. So <laughs> Ben, do you know of any parents that would might be interested and might also add some diversity? Um, I do not know of any parents that would be interested at this time. I mean, I think the PTO is definitely the first place. You, I mean, you want to contact the parents as much as possible. So, so will someone do that? I can reach out to the PTO. Okay, outstanding. Um, Although, Peter, you have 
such a useful perspective that you bring to this committee. I would love for you to stay on. Um, if we are able to continue doing online meetings, as you say, after COVID, to allow you to travel and still participate, I would be strongly in favor of doing that. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, but we'll see. I mean, like I said, I haven't, I haven't totally decided. It's just that, you know, I mean, I all day today, I'm sort of like, oh man, it'd be nice not to have this meeting because I worry about you know, stuff and so on, so. Totally understand. It can't be more stressful than this year moving forward. It just, it, <laughs> you'll be looking for a new, you'll be looking for a new superintendent too, you so. <laughs> no, I mean, I went through the same thing when I, I used to run the finance committee and I mean, honest to God, this morning, I woke up at five o'clock because I had to go to the bathroom and then I'm just lying there. I get back in the bed and I'm lying there and I'm thinking about the school budget. Okay, and finally it's, you know, Six, I wait, you know, I wait like an hour. I'm lying there thinking about the school budget, and then I get up and start writing an email. If you notice, it was sent at seven o'clock this morning, you know. It was, <laughs> and it's just, I mean, it reminds me of when I used to run the finance committee in town. And I remember nights when I'd be lying there, and all of a sudden I think, oh Christ, I'm a hundred thousand off on all my figures. And I'd be going through all my mind, you know, if I got it right, if I got it right, whatever, and whatever. So, you know, we manage, but we all have our own foibles. Wow. Oh, anyway, sorry. I, you know, it's, I really like the committee. I mean, it's just such a good group of people. And it's such a pleasure to have such good leadership in the administration. It's just unbelievable change from when I just first joined. Um, how well, Ben, you're still here, but the other two are, are joined Ben in terms of just unbelievable talent. And uh, man, does that make a difference? It was a good find on my end. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, wow. Jessica, you'll you'll pursue at least some contacts. Okay. I guess on that note, we'll take a a, a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right. I'll second. <laughs> oh, outstanding. All right. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Keith? Yes. Peter? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Greg, yes. All right, well, thank you all. Thank you.